This week, we're recapping the races at Michigan and Mid-Ohio, looking ahead to Thunder Valley, and we're chatting with Kaz. Here in the party lounge. No, Kaz, this is the pace lap. Well, we're going to party anyway. Yeah, we're definitely going to party. <laughs> this weekend, NASCAR is taking the action under the lights at Bristol Motor Speedway. At this short track, there's no shortage of beating and banging, and with a nickname like Thunder Valley, it's guaranteed to get loud. Welcome to the Pace Lab, I'm Jesse Punch. After an exciting weekend at Michigan in Mid-Ohio, all three of NASCAR's National Series are teaming up to take on Bristol, Tennessee. We're going to be breaking down that short track a little later on in the show, and we have Kaz Gorala here to help us do so. But first, let's take a look back at some of NASCAR's other series all around the world. The K&N Pro Series West was in action at Evergreen Speedway in Washington last week. Derek Thorne led the final 60 laps to take the checkered flag, his second win this season. In the Penty Series was at Trois-Rivières in Quebec over the weekend. Alex Tagliani earned his first win of the season. He beat LP Dumoulin to the finish. Dumoulin two-time winner this season, so exciting first win for Tagliani. And at the start of the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series race on Saturday, John Hunter Nemechek is on the pole, but 14 laps in, Stuart Friesen steals the lead, and he goes on to win stage one. At the start of stage two, Grant Infinger is out front on the restart, and he held that lead through the entire stage, through two cautions. He earns the stage two point. A late race caution with 20 to go set up a restart and it came down to the final lap. A battle between Johnny Sauter and Brett Moffitt and Moffitt barely edges out Sauter coming around turn four to take the checkered flag. His fourth win this season. With me this week is a second time co-host here on the Pace Lap, driver of the number 61 Ford for Fury Race Cars, Kaz Gralla. Kaz, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. I know that you were just coming off the weekend at Mid-Ohio and you were getting ready to hop in the car while this truck race, truck race was going on. So I don't expect that you, that you watched it, but uh, we did just catch the highlights. Another incredibly close finish. Brett Moffitt just barely edging out Johnny Sauter. We've got to talk about Brett Moffitt. People have been doing it all season long, but with the playoffs coming, he's really making some noise with those four wins. This is kind of a, a little team that could scenario here. What do you think about Moffitt? Yeah, I, I think it's cool watching the truck series because they talk about the big three in, in cup, and I think it's the big two in trucks this year, at least so far. So it's been good watching Johnny and, and Brett battle it out. And I got to tell you, that was a surprising finish for me because uh, I thought knowing Johnny and how he knows how to block the runs with the arrow, I thought for sure that, that he had him covered. And it was just he slipped up two inches in the last corner, and Brett was right there to take advantage of it. So uh, that, that was pretty exciting to watch, and I'm sure we'll get to see more of that in the playoffs for them. So looking at the cutoff here for playoff points, Matt Crafton barely squeezing by here, but is there anything that stands out to you? Anyone that you could see maybe solidifying a spot in these next couple races? Well, I got to tell you, if I'm Matt Crafton, I'm pretty worried about Todd Gilliland right now because there's only one race left. It's Bristol, but you look back at KBM's past performances at Bristol and they've, they've got a pretty good hold on that track. And I believe they just tested there last year with uh, Christopher Bell. So... Uh, I know that they're going to have a good truck and they're going to be putting all their effort into to Todd Gilliland and he's had a really fast truck so far this season so if he plays his cards right he could get him one and, and I can tell you Crafton uh, will not be too happy about that but it's crazy thinking about Crafton being on the bubble just over the last few years in the truck series you think about him as winning a bunch of races and always being a championship contender so he's in a position to be a little worried right now and Todd Gilliland's the one that could spoil that. I do want to look ahead to Bristol in a little bit, but first, let's keep recapping the weekend with the Xfinity Series race. Let's check out some highlights from Mid-Ohio. Austin Sindrick led the field to the green at the start of the Xfinity race, but 17 laps in, Justin Allgaier gains the lead as Sindrick headed to the pits, and Allgaier takes stage one. At the start of stage two, that pit stop earlier put Sindrick back in the lead, and he held on to it through the entire stage, earning the stage two point. Lap 61, trouble for the nine of Tyler Reddick. Looks like he blew a right rear tire. And that's the end of the day for them. 
After a caution comes out for fluid on the track, a restart with just five laps to go, and Cindric is out front. But with three to go, Allgaier steals the lead, and he takes the checkered flag for the third time this season. So, Kaz, you were in that race at Mid-Ohio. Not the best finish that we've seen from you guys this season. What happened? Well, we had a really good car, and especially on the long run, we were, we were pretty solid. Uh, stage three there, they had a long green flag run, and we actually restarted 20th and drove all the way up to ninth, and we were catching the pack that, that was sixth through eighth right in front of us. So we could see a really good finish, and uh, when the, the late race cautions came out, we decided to pit, and uh, it was definitely the right call, but unfortunately, it put us back in traffic. We were coming forward, and I still think we were going to grab a top 10, and unfortunately, we got uh, dumped from behind, and the caution didn't come out, so we ended up just finishing pretty much last on the lead lap, but that's the challenge of that track. That was my first time ever being there, and, and now I can say for sure it's like the Martinsville of road courses. It's really tight. It's really easy to, to play some bumper tag, and uh, unfortunately, uh, came out on the right end of it a few times, but not that last time. We came out on the wrong end of it. So um, you'll, you'll have that sometimes, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll come back at uh, Road America and, and try to grab a better finish at least, bring the same car and see if we can't make it a little bit faster. Well, I do want to look at the Xfinity standings as well with the playoffs just around the corner. Check out the cutoff point here. Ross Chastain on the line with Michael Annette what about these standings? You're a little closer to these because you're actually racing these guys every weekend. What stands out to you when you look at these? Well, I can definitely feel for Michael Annette because just a few weeks ago, I was the guy trying to chase down Ross Chastain for that playoff spot. And uh, so I, I think Ross right now just needs to have some solid races and, and he may be able to stay ahead of these guys. But all it takes is a mechanical failure and all of a sudden uh, the, the five cars right back in the hunt right there. And, um, and then the further you get towards the playoffs starting, the more pressure builds and you're more likely to see guys making mistakes. So um, right now he's got a little bit of breathing room over Annette, but I wouldn't be surprised to see at some point uh, that tighten up and, and come down to the last couple races. So I'll be eager to watch that. Some more Xfinity news that actually came out this week. Elliot Sadler announced that this will be his last season running full time as a driver. Over 800 starts for him in all three of NASCAR's major series. Hard to believe this is the last few times we'll see him driving a race car. Yeah, I mean, it's cool cool that I got to race him in his last year because he, he's been around a long time and, and there's a lot of history there. And uh, he's still really, really good. I mean, he's been leading points for a lot of this season. He's right up there for that battle still. So uh, I'm sure the guys battling up front for the points lead are happy to hear that for next year because it, it makes their jobs maybe a little bit easier. Um, but but yeah, it, it's been awesome to, to race against Elliot and I've chatted with him a little bit and picked his brain at, at some of these tracks I've never been to before and he's always been really helpful. So uh, I'm excited for him and his future uh, after full-time competition. Absolutely. Like you said, still got a, got a few races to compete in this season, doing pretty well, but I will be uh, anxious to see where he goes from here. Let's look ahead to the cup highlights from last weekend and check out the action from Michigan. Denny Hamlin on the pole, second week in a row. He's up front, but trouble early on for Eric Jones. Issue in turn four sends him into the infield grass, bringing out the first caution of the day. Less than 10 laps later, another caution comes out. This time it's the 24 of William Byron and the 78 of Martin Truex Jr. On the restart after the competition caution, Kevin Harvick is up front. And just 10 laps later, more trouble for the 20 team. He gets in the back of the 12 car of Ryan Blaney and hits the outside wall. But at the end of stage two, Harvick is still out front and he is your stage two winner. Lap 134, debris on the track causes a major issue for Ty Dillon. He ran over what we think is a battery, setting fire to the under part of his car. Dillon was okay though, you'll see him put the safety net down and climb out, walk away just fine, but did cause some major damage to his car and took him out of the race for the rest of the day. With 10 to go, Harvick regains that front spot and he pulls ahead to cruise his way to the finish line, taking the checkered flag for the seventh time this season. 
Another week of another member of the big three, as they're calling them, taking the checkered flag. But one of the, the big stories that people were talking about even after the race was over was, was Ty Dillon's accident. The biggest question post-race was, why didn't he see it? Why didn't he avoid it? Can you give me a little bit of an insight from a driver's perspective about how it's, it's not just that easy to, to avoid it? Well, I mean, we saw a couple guys going down the back straight away. Larson comes to mind, avoid it. Uh, but I saw that Ty came off turn two racing uh, a guy and side drafting him. And so I can tell you from my perspective, when you're trying to pull another guy back and get the edge on them going into the corner, you're kind of looking out your right side, trying to figure out where you are on their door to decide if you want to be close to them or come off of them. So you're really looking more over there rather than on the racetrack. But from a debris perspective, I know anytime I see something on the racetrack, 99% of the time, it's not a big deal. It's usually a piece of tape or something really, really little that you'll run over, you won't even feel it, and it will, it'll be a complete non-issue. So if you see that ahead, your initial thought is, well, I'm sure it's really nothing, until you get up to it. And by that point, it's kind of too late to do anything about it. And as we saw, that was bad news for, for him and his car. So, um, but that was really just a bizarre accident. I don't think that, at least it's not anything I've ever come across before. I, it's not common at all. So I don't know if it really warrants any rule per se. It's just we're on the racetrack going extremely fast. Sometimes something's going to go wrong. And that was just one of those weird situations where it did. Another big highlight, though, from that cup race was obviously Kevin Harvick's win, but it was Kevin Harvick's counterpart in victory lane, his little mini me, his son Keelan. We've been seeing a lot of kids and a lot of uh, driver's kids running around the track. Do you have any fond memories as a, as a young race car driver? Anything that, that stands out to you? Well, the story I always tell, uh, my number one childhood story is in my very first go-kart race ever, uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I was four <laughs> years old and I jumped in this go-kart and apparently I was leading the race. I had no idea. I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, but the race was drawing on a little bit too long. I mean, it was like an eight lap race. We were already on lap six and I was just tired of it. So I came down pit lane and asked for a juice box and a snack. I found my dad in the pits and stopped right at his feet and asked for a juice box and a snack. And he's like, do you not know you just were leading that race and now you lost the race? And I had no clue what that meant. And I had my juice box and I was happy. So it, was, it really wasn't until I was seven that I figured out what racing even was and that I wanted to be the guy leading. Back when I was four, I was just interested in, in my snacks and having a fun Saturday. So I feel like Keelan is sort of more at that point in his life, but I'm sure we'll see him when it races at some point. Keelan was great in victory lane, and it is always great to see the drivers sharing these moments with their kids because this is that we saw the picture this weekend of Keelan and his little go-kart. This is the future of NASCAR. So as cute and as fun as that was, the playoffs are right around the corner and it's important to see where we're headed. So let's check out the cutoff line here for the cup playoffs. This is interesting because Stenhouse, Suarez and Newman all run very, very well at Bristol. Stenhouse actually has the current uh, best average finish of any active driver. So. If we were to see a win from one of these guys this weekend, that could definitely shake things up. But even taking it a step further, you have Paul Menard and Jamie McMurray who have wins at the Brickyard. So don't know if that'll happen, but there is a possibility of seeing some drivers come out, come out and pick up some wins. And if that were to happen, might not be seeing Jimmy Johnson in the playoffs for the first time in his career. I don't know the likeliness of that but it's interesting and it's a good story to follow absolutely i mean ricky's been really good at bristol as you mentioned and i feel like roush has been finding some speed as of late this season so if the race goes their way i mean you could absolutely see i mean all it takes is towards the end you may get the preferred line restart or something simple like that or, or pit lane strategy and put him in position to win the race and that changes everything and Paul Menard, like you said, he's won the Brickyard race, and that 21 team is strong this year and last year. They've got a lot of speed, so I would not be surprised to see them come out swinging at, at Indianapolis. So this is I'm, I'm going to be keeping my eye on, eye on this because this is going to be pretty interesting the next coming weeks. 
Well, heading into this weekend at Bristol, we had Brad Kislowski take a few laps in our NASCAR Heat 2 simulator to give us some advice on how he takes on that short track. So let's see what he had to say. All right, here we go. Pulling out of the pits, Bristol Motor Speedway at the Coliseum. One of the things you'll notice about Bristol right away is just how it feels like a fishbowl. All the stands around you make such a big difference. No horizon, all you have is the racetrack. It's easy to get lost in where you are at the racetrack. I'm in three and four. And you run the top in three and four. And sometimes you forget where you're at. The only way you know is that start finish line we just passed. One and two, you can run the bottom of it. All, but three and four, you need to be up top here, right up against this wall, sometimes almost hitting it, like I just did. A lot of speed up against the wall. One and two, sometimes you'll fly out wide right there when you run the bottom. Tough to get around. Try and make a pass. If you can get to the outside of someone at Bristol, that's where you make your best passes. You might ask, why do you want to run the outside of Bristol? Because you can see all that dark surface is where all the grip is. The track takes rubber. It's a concrete surface, so when it takes rubber, it really gains a lot of grip in the high lanes. And that's the lap around Bristol. Bristol is one of those tracks that everybody looks forward to every season, and especially in the fall because you're racing under the lights. And for a fan, I don't, I really don't think it gets any better than that. Um, but there's a lot of things about that track that make it unique, which actually leads me to this week's fast fact. Bristol Motor Speedway is a true amphitheater. It's completely enclosed by seating and holds 165,000 people, making it the largest amphitheater in the whole world. It's also one of the steepest tracks with bankings of 24 to 26 degrees. And given this bowl-like structure, Bristol is known for being incredibly loud. So much so that it's nicknamed Thunder Valley. Kaz, even though you're not running this weekend at Bristol, I know that this is a track that can present some challenges to drivers. So break this down for me a little bit and give me a little bit of, of insight about this short track. As you said, everyone looks forward to it. It's the most fun race that we do, but it's one of the hardest, I'd say. I mean, physically, the track takes a lot out of you because that high of speed on such a little track with so much banking really wears you down with the, the G-forces. And the straightaways, if you look at the track from above, it looks like there are straightaways that is definitely fake news. When you're on the track, it feels like as soon as you come out of the turn, you're going right back in. So uh, straightaways are what help give drivers a break and catch their breath. Well, you don't get that there. So it's just one constant uh, thrash inside of the car. And, and then they throw the, uh, the PJ1 down, and that's changing and evolving throughout the race. And you're having to keep up with that, almost reading the track like a dirt track. Let me tell you, it is the busiest that you could possibly be in a race car. So uh, I know picturing 200 to 300 laps there in trucks and Xfinity is crazy to me. And then you say 500 for the Cup Series, and I just, I can't even imagine that. So uh, it, it's a fun race to be in, and it's a fun race to watch. I'm glad you mentioned that because that is a track that a lot of race fans, and even non-race fans, want to go visit. It's just, it's a great event to watch and it's a great monumental coliseum to visit and as someone who's been there obviously it's nicknamed thunder valley you tell me firsthand what the noise is like it's it's crazy especially when you're standing in the infield while a race is going on you could be standing a foot away from someone else and there's not a chance you're going to understand a word they're saying uh, even in the race car, it's one of those races where if you're racing side by side for a long time with another car, just the echoing becomes so loud. You don't notice it until after the race. You, maybe you board the plane after the event is over and your ears are just ringing. And it's, it's like that for about the next 24 hours. It's just one of those places uh, that, that really is loud no matter if you're in the car, in the stands, in the infield. It's good to know that it takes the drivers 
a couple days to recover from Bis Bristol as well, because I think it takes the fans that go to <laughs> Bristol a couple days to recover from there as well. It's, it's quite the event. I'm definitely looking forward to this weekend. Well, speaking of this weekend, let's check out the weekend schedule. Very, very busy weekend, a lot of racing, but kicking it off in Bristol, the Wheel and Modified Tour on Thursday, followed by the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series later that night. And on Friday, the Xfinity Series will take on Thunder Valley in the Food City 300. And wrapping up the action in Bristol, the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series on Saturday night under the lights. More short track racing though on Saturday, a little north in Canada, the Pinty Series will be at Riverside International Speedway. And to round out the weekend, the Peak Mexico Series and the Arca Series will both be in action on Sunday. Kaz, it's always a pleasure having you on the Pace Lab. You are so great at breaking down the tracks. I really do feel like I have a better understanding of what it's like to be a driver out there whenever we, we chat. So thank you for coming. Well, bring me back on. I'll tell you about every other track that you want to know. Absolutely. Anytime you're free, come on. <laughs> well, that's all for this episode of the Pace Lab. I'm Jesse Punch here with Kaz Gralla. Thanks for watching. We'll see you at the track.